Services Manager for Mackley. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Mackley so that you know some of the background of where we're coming from. Um, we're generally a main contractor. We do occasionally do tier two, but most of the time we're a main contractor. Um, we've got a framework with the Environment Agency and 70% of our work is, uh, is for the Environment Agency and similar customers. Uh, we specialize in flood defense and coastal maintenance and piling works, um, primarily around the South Coast, but we work nationally and internationally. Um, we were a family company up until 2014 when Van Nord, who are one of our joint venture partners on the EA framework, along with Keir and Royal Hasconing, um, purchased us. Um, that was great because it's given us um, a bit more flexibility. It also gives us the support that we get from Rotterdam on some of the more technical uh, projects that we start working on. The type of projects that we do, this is Molsey Weir at Hampton Court. We replaced uh, in total um, seven radial gates on the River Thames, uh, new fish pass, um, as you can see, a lot of M&E work which we put out to our supply chain, um, a lot of electrical work, a lot of O&M manuals that come out of this, and a lot of information that we have to pass on to the client that we, that we also need to make available to our site teams. This was a two-year project split into two halves, and again, that information had to be transferred from year to year. Uh, Port Sea Island, uh, down near Portsmouth, more traditional earth embankment with some rock protection. Uh, a bit more unusual for us. We don't normally do buildings, which is why BIM is a bit more difficult for us to um, to apply um, on most of our projects. In this case, we were doing the groundworks and the foundations for Ben Ainsley Racing, and we also got involved as main contractor for installing the staircase on uh, London Bridge, uh, primarily because of our health and safety knowledge. Uh, one of our very unusual projects was um, carrying out the civils works and acting as principal contractor on the I360 in Brighton. Um, what you see here is the foundation holding down bolts and the whole of that void was filled with concrete. Um, and that is basically what holds up the I360 um, iconic tower in Brighton. Uh, so my background, I am not a BIM professional. I'm a civil engineer. I do do BIM now. It's very much part time um, in terms of my job. I'm a design manager for uh, Mackley predominantly. Uh, having said that previously, I've been a consultant. Um, I've worked for the Environment Agency both as an asset manager and managing incident response across the uh, Thames and Southern regions, actually. Um, and I've been with Mackley now for uh, 11 years, again, both as a site manager, actually constructing things on site um, and getting dirty, and now as design manager and technical services manager. Um, so why did we go with a common data environment and what are we trying to get out of it? Um, we need BIM Level 2 compliance. Most or 70% of our work is now supposed to be BIM Level 2 compliant, and we've got a lot of other clients that are pushing for um, BIM Level 2, and they want to know more about BIM and how it's going to help them. Um, we've had incidents on sites, like many of you have, I'm sure, where a single point of truth would have solved that happening. Um, so if everybody on a project, if all the project um, support team are buying into the same amount of data, the same information, and it's always the latest version, obviously that gives you uh, uh, you know, control of your risks on site. And also we were looking for business continuity. We wanted our information up in the cloud and we wanted it accessible remotely and not relying on our own servers in our office, which were obviously at risk. Uh, has it been plain sailing? No, it hasn't. Um, primarily, um, because we need to get everybody to buy in to using BIM, and that's been a problem across the industry, particularly where you're not working on architectural type projects. Uh, to try and get embedment with our own business, we've actually split our CDE into three areas, and we use it across the business. So as well as in projects, um, we also use, also use it for our process management control and have a reference information area where we keep all of our procedures and process documents and all our forms, and our departments use it so that they keep their own data within BC. And that way, we just make sure that all of our staff know how to use it and are familiar with it. Um, so what's the big problem? Getting individuals and multiple um, organizations on a project to use a single common data environment. Um, the whole point of BIM is that it's in one place. The problem is you've got lots of people involved, particularly in the NEC3 contracts we use, um, such as ECCPMs, ECC, ECC supervisors, the client side designers, principal designers, they've all got their own ideas and email works, doesn't it? It's worked for years, um, like the fax machine did before that. Um, the information needs to be easily accessible by everyone with a minimum amount of training and support. The real problem is 
People don't like asking for help, and if they're not sure about something, they'd rather avoid using it. The problem with BIM and the problem with the common data environment is as soon as someone starts avoiding its use, it doesn't become that single point of truth, and the whole thing starts to fall over. To get around that, you've got to make it intuitive, and you've got to make it so that it's simple for everybody to use, and for everybody to access information on all types of devices. Um, so this is the project that I really wanted to talk about, um, or one of the projects, and, and this is how we came about using GIS um, to try and help us. And we fell over, we, we came across the business collaborator form of GIS and the viewer by accident, really. Um, this is 7.2 7 kilometers of flood defense works that we're doing in Shoreham. Um, it's a project that's gonna go over, probably over three years now. Um, it's quite an expensive project in terms of the commitment from the environment agency. The real problem is the number of landowners that are involved and the number of stakeholders involved and trying to manage access to every individual property, which are literally houses on a lot of these banks, and making sure you've got the right consents in place, you've issued the notice that you're coming in and you've got the landowner agreement was a logistical nightmare, um, which was passed on to us to try and manage. Uh, we decided that the best way to do that was graphically by producing a GIS model um, that would effectively produce a rag status on um, which areas we were allowed to work in. The problem was we didn't want to start a reach and find that there was one person that we'd forgotten to get permissions from and it would have stopped the whole reach. Uh, we started by using QGIS, which was uh, you know, a free GIS uh, platform. Um, it was quite powerful. We got our colleagues in Rotterdam involved. Uh, we set the, um, the system up so it could produce rag statuses. The problem was it wasn't accessible to everybody. Uh, we had a lot of information in there, but it just wasn't taken on board on the project and turned into something that people were prepared to use. And by default, people went back to managing it in spreadsheets because uh, that's what they were comfortable with. Um, by accident, while we were carrying out that work in QGIS, we, we discovered that we could access documents within our common data environment by um, saving hyperlinks to save searches. And we could put those hyperlinks within a Google Earth environment. So this is a screenshot of what we were using with Google Earth. Um, the areas marked in there are the areas of interest and the drawing areas for uh, the project. And by clicking on one of those areas, the KML file uh, would open up a dialog box. That would take you to a hyperlink that took you into Business Collaborator. It worked great. You could use it on your phone, on your tablet. Um, the only problem was it was a little bit clunky. You kept up to log in and log out. Um, putting those files into Google Earth was something that the individual had to do on, a, on, a, on their own platform or their own piece of um, computer hardware or laptop or phone and so on. So again, we didn't really get the buy-in that we wanted. Um, we had a few discussions with a business collaborator how we could tie things up and that's when we discovered that they were already working on the GIS viewer uh, with some of their other customers and we sort of um, imposed our will on them a, a little bit um, so I'll just rather than show you what our system will actually do I just want to show you how quick it is to set up <clears throat> um, the problem that we've still got is that when we go onto a project so we talk to our estimators uh, the reaction I get is yeah it looks great but it takes a lot to set up it's not worth doing it on this project so what I want to demonstrate is here is just how easy it is to to set up a hyperlink um, so uh, within any search within Business Collaborator, you can filter, you can search for things within each of the metadata fields, and you can select what items you want to appear. So in this case, we're in the published area, which means we're only gonna pull up documents that have been published and have passed that verification stage. Uh, we're looking at reach W6, so we're only gonna look at one of the 10 reaches that are on the system. Um, and we can add information into any other of those. So we could put a status, we could put who it was originated by. If we were looking for temporary works, and we've done that temporary works design in-house in this case, if we did the originator as a drawing from TVO, that would return all of our temporary works. So you need to think a little bit about what you, you want your search to actually produce. Um, so having gone through this process, we select what we want and we save it. We save it into Business Collaborator, and we publish it um, and from that we can create a link to that search now the important thing is here this isn't a link to a document this is a link to a search which means if people add new documents that get picked up by that search it will bring those documents in automatically if people revise documents 
it will bring in the latest revision of those documents. So you always get an up-to-date up information and you only have to save this link and set this up in the mapping tool once. Um, so we were then going back to Google Earth, and we still are, we save that hyperlink within the um, Google Earth tool and we put it on a pin, on a trapezoid, on a line, on any shape that we want, any icon basically. We save that KML file, which is what Google Earth works in, into Business Collaborator, and as long as we put it anywhere within the project that we want it to appear, Business Collaborator will find it automatically. By clicking on the map icon in the top right-hand side, where it normally says listings, uh, we can go straight into the mapping tool in Business Collaborator, and Business Collaborator has found our W6 drawings, it's put the layer in there, by ticking on it, we bring up the pins, we can then click on a pin and it will take us to a dialog box, which then opens up the hyperlink, um, which takes us straight into the search. Um, the advantage of this is we can set several of these mapping tools up. They appear in layers the same as they would do in Google Earth, which people are used to using. You can turn those layers on and off. Um, in this case, we've got local authority boundaries, EA, um, flood data and triple SI information, which has been imported automatically for us by Business Collaborator and is kept up to date by their own teams. Um, and we want to take this a stage further. So at the end of the day, um, we need to hand this information over to the client as an ONM manual and as a health and safety file. And we're quite excited with PAS 1192 Part 6 coming out um, that we can graphically show health and safety information on a mapping tool accessible from phones and from any other um, device, be it Mac or PC. Um, and you can either pull up the ONM manual, in this case the, the I, um, which that hyperlink will take you to information about the floodgate, what it's operating, limits are operation and maintenance manuals. Um, the icon in this case will take you, the, 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 the um, exclamation mark, the hazard icon, will take you to information on a confined space entry uh, chamber there and a manhole that has to be opened in a particular way. Um, so where we've got elevated risks, we can show these on a document, and this information is accessible to our teams, all our supply chain, and to the client, and we can pass this information through at the end, including the, the graphic tool. The nice thing with Business Collaborator is in, in creating that search and getting the hyperlink to the search, it also produces a QR code. That QR code can be printed, put out onto a site, and so even if the guy hasn't got his phone handy or can't be bothered to search, if he goes to that manual chamber, there's a QR code, he clicks on that, it will give him the risk assessments, meta statements, and everything else he needs to do the work, or in the maintenance period, highlight what hazards are there that he may not be available, uh, may not be aware of. Um, and that gives us direct access straight from site. All of that works fine, as long as the information that's been uploaded is in the right format, is... Um, set out in the right way and has the right metadata. And we're delighted that um, Business Collaborator in their latest version have introduced placeholders. This lets us set up a series of effectively blank documents and our supply chain just have to search for what it is they're trying to produce. So in this case, Temporary Works Designer, he goes in, we can put a description in there for um, Cofferdam uh, and it could be on a certain site, it could be a plan elevation or whatever. He does a quick search, finds the placeholder that he's looking for and then all he has to do is upload his document into that placeholder. It doesn't matter what he's called his document, the um, document name is changed, the metadata is added automatically, and we then know that his information will appear in those searches and that the information he's uploaded is then BIM 1192 compliant and we can pass it through to the client CDE at the end of the project, um, knowing that we're, uh, we're not relying on um, our supply chain being experts in BIM. Um, which, to be fair, they're certainly not. Uh, right, well, I'm going to take the risk of going live now. <laughs> so this is the home page in our own um, common data environment. And what I want to illustrate here is uh, one of the projects that we're working on at the moment. A lot of our sites um, have multiple locations or they're along a, a length of shoreline, along a beach. Um, and they aren't individual locations where we can rely on using a 3D model. Um, in fact, very often we don't have a 3D model to work with unless we've actually started doing some survey work and setting out work ourselves. Um, so in this case, uh, the Riverway project has got um, seven locations 
Uh, as I say, this is our common data environment, so we've got work in progress, shared and published, uh, communications and photos. If I go up to the right hand side, as well as the listing, we can go into the map area. And that goes and looks for any KML files we've set within the Riverway Weirs, and here we are, we've got the one that we've set up for the locations, the project's quite new at the moment and isn't really up and running yet. Um, and if I click on Ham Oils, because that's the area that I'm interested in, it takes me straight into the pin for Ham Oils. Um, I could click on the pin, um, but because I know which site I want to go to, it's actually already opened up the dialog box. And what we've got here is a number of hyperlinks, each with their own title. So uh, if I stay away so I don't keep clicking the uh, <laughs> thing up. So um, the top one is site-specific drawings. On these particular sites, there's a series of weirs down the river way, and on each site, there are some drawings that are specific to that location. There are a number of drawings that are generic and apply to all of those locations. Problem is, with using a normal search function, um, if you're looking for all the drawings at Ham Oil, um, you won't find the generic ones unless you put those generic ones in every location. As soon as you start creating multiple drawings of the same drawing or multiple locations of the same drawing, you've got the problem of you've lost your version control. By using this method, um, we've got the site-specific drawings with a hyperlink, and we've then got the general drawings, but they still appear under Ham Oils. If we went to Broadmead Weir, I'd get the same set of general drawings. Um, I also get a site-specific map, and I get a site access map. And all our teams have to do is basically click on site-specific drawings, and it gives me a list of all the drawings relevant to that site, which then I can then filter into these various areas by um, who's created it, by the description, or whichever uh, way I want to do it. To get back to the home page, I'll just click on BC, and I'll show you our Shoreham project. So this is the one I talked about earlier, which is where we actually developed the system. And again, we've standard layout, um, we've got WIP shared and published, um, we've also keep our tender information in there as a baseline and we've got communications and photos. If I go into the mapping on this particular project, uh, there was, it's 7.2 kilometres of, of um, piling and groundworks, so there are an awful lot of boreholes. Um, if I click on the boreholes and I list the boreholes, you can see um, there are one or two boreholes there. Finding which one you actually want to look at, which one's relevant, and which is the one that you need to use um, isn't always easy. Um, if I, for instance, want to know where this borehole is, it takes me straight into the mapping and it straight me to, takes me to that borehole. If that isn't the right one for where I want to work, and I'm actually working the other side of the railway, and I click here, it will just transfer across, and I've then got the link to the log, and I've got the link to the main report. The main report's about 300 pages long, and most people want to read it. Um, if you're an engineer and you're looking for something specific, you may want to open it and you can get there. Most of the guys on site, the site engineers and our piling guys, they can do this on their phone just as easily as they can do it on, um, on a laptop, and get straight into the log and they can get that information to find out why their piles suddenly stop going in the ground or what may be an issue.